Henry Knipe is going to come give us a presentation next on some of the work he's done on life cycle cost analysis for the Utah DOT. Henry is the Fleet and Supply Chain Man Management Practice Leader for Asset Management Associates. He brings over 35 years of experience helping organizations improve overall efficiency and effectiveness. His professional background includes over 16 years of experience providing fleet and management consulting services, including two years in the asset management software industry. Prior to becoming a consultant, Mr. Knipe spent 20 years directing commercial trucking operations, including eight years as a trucking industry executive, including in the city where I grew up, Charleston. Henry has performed near, nearly 50 public sector consulting engagements that have included working with over 15 state DOTs. Major fleet engagements include the North Carolina, Virginia, Texas, and Utah DOTs, as well as a number of transit agencies, cities, counties, fire, and water authorities, and airports. Henry has an MBA degree from the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and is a longtime participant in TRB and its programs, having participated in a number of participated in a number of projects through the various TRB research programs. Everybody, let's welcome Henry Knipe. Thank you all for having me this morning. Uh, appreciate the introduction, John. I guess the message I got from that introduction was I'm old. <laughs> so, <laughs> I won't argue with that. But in any event, this was an interesting project that uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share it with you folks. I think you will find uh, one of the messages that you won't see written in this pr uh, presentation, but it's definitely there, is that this uh, project is as much about public policy as it is about fleet. And uh, that'll, that'll be a message we'll get into a little bit more. But uh, I do want to, before I, since I don't have a slide acknowledging it, I do want to acknowledge the uh, project uh, sponsors. As I say, our client was the Utah Department of Transportation. We were working directly with a gentleman by the name of Tim Ulrich. He's the Deputy State Maintenance Manager. And uh, Jeff Casper, the Fleet Manager, was uh, participated very intensely in this project. And uh, Jeff is a member of the uh, Heavy Main or the Maintenance Equipment Committee, uh, like myself. I do want to take one more second to say uh, this is my 16th TRB in a row. And this is the best presented session I've seen on uh, equipment management. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see this. So. Without further ado, uh, as I say, this the project was for the Utah Department of Transportation. UDOT has a fleet of about 5,000 uh, uh, pieces of equipment with a replacement value of about $200 million. The subject of this uh, project was their Class 8 snowplow fleet. They have about 500 of those uh, pieces of equipment. And uh, one of the key issues that drove this study was, as you can see, their fleet age has been rising. From 2009, they had an average Class 8 snowplow fleet of 8.4 years, and it's risen to 10.3 years and steadily trending upward. Uh, one, of the, one of the more interesting aspects of the Utah fleet, and it's not unique, uh, but it is a, a, a component, is their light duty fleet. Essentially, one ton vehicles and down are all provided by general services. They're not actually owned by UDOT at all. And that actually is part and parcel of part of the public policy issue I was stating. So therefore, they pay for their light duty fleet through their operating budget, but their capital fleet, their class eight fleet, is actually a line item budget into their appropriations request of the legislature. And again, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. It's sort of a, a common issue for the DOTs, I'm afraid. This slide here, you can see that the, uh, uh, and this is a bit of a misnomer, this chart was divided or provided by UDOT, that they've been spending around $8, or $8 million a year to replace their uh, capital equipment fleet. Now this capital equipment fleet is not just snow flies. it also includes their heavy equipment, but it's primarily smoke flies. it's probably 60-70% of that, and on a given year, they will fluctuate between buying snow plows or buying excavators or buying front loaders or whatever. So, uh, but you can see that for the most part, it's a fairly erratic funding pattern. Uh, that one year you see the big spike was associated with an expansion of the I-15 interstate out in Utah and uh, the, uh, they got a special appropriation to add trucks to support that, uh, those lane miles on that roadway. But uh, that's, uh, as those of you who are fleet professionals will certainly agree with me that one of the real issues in fleet 
is that fleets want to be treated systematically. They want to be treated year over year with a steady funding. You need to replace these things systematically, and it just doesn't happen in the public sector, and that is just an endemic problem. There are snowplow repair trends. As you can see, in 2010, they spent $2 million repairing these plows. And as of 2014, they're at $3 million. That's a 50% increase over four years. And obviously, that's a pretty strong trend. And that's not a trend that's really sustainable over time. And of course, part of that, and part and parcel of it, is that fleet age that we can see. I do want to make a couple of comments here fairly. I guess I'll just go ahead and make them now. There's some very unusual aspects to the Utah uh, DOT that I, I think are, are worth mentioning to put in context. Utah's a fairly rural state, but the population is, is very concentrated in, in a central area of the state, and the rest of the state is extremely rural. Uh, the the uh, Utah DOT is responsible for maintaining all the secondary roads, the U.S. roads, and the interstates. The cities maintain their local roads, but the DOTs basically maintain the roads going through them. UDOT has a complete responsibility for road clearance on those roads that they maintain. There is no contracted road clearance in the, at the Utah DOT. And conversely, and this is the most important point, I think, is that the state of Utah constrains UDOT from performing any summer maintenance projects of over $150,000 per project. So effectively, if you put those things together, effectively the operational scenario is you've got complete responsibility for keeping the roads clear in Utah, yet you've got nothing to do with those trucks in the summertime because $150,000 won't pass your pothole. So though you've got a very conflicting set of operational uh, constraints uh, that the Utah DOT is operating in, and it's really part and parcel of this, this fleet study. Uh, for those of you who are operational people, since this is a snow maintenance committee, it should be known that essentially the guys who are pushing the snow in the wintertime are doing construction inspection in the summer. So they, they completely switch those jobs. So that's part and parcel of the, the message here and, and what uh, this project was about. This project came and there were six tasks that were intentionally asking three questions. When should you not replace its class eight snow plow trucks? What kind of funding would need to be uh, in place in order to achieve that replacement target? And how should uh, UDOT press some units with cracked frames? And I'm gonna talk about that in the next couple of slides. That's again, that was another big factor in this project is UDOT, as of those 500 trucks they have, about 150 of those trucks, they're having a, uh, uh, a problem with the design that has since been remedied, but the bottom line is 150 of the 500 trucks they have have a problematic design. And they've already had about 50 of those trucks that they've had major frame cracks that I'll show you now that represent a, a critical issue to try to get these vehicles replaced. This slide here, if you can try to get oriented, what you're looking at is the frame rail right behind the truck uh, uh, chassis, or right behind the truck cab. And as you can see, that dark crack running uh, linearly or horizontally is literally, that's the frame rail. It's got a major crack right through that thing. And just to put it in perspective, I have a slide later. I mean, that's a, that's a truck killer. I mean, there's hardly any circumstance that you can do anything with that truck that's a long-term fix except get rid of it. And, and that was, again, that was a major factor why that Utah funded this study. Here's a side view of that same truck. And as you can see, you can, I mean, uh, it's fairly obvious the metal flaking, this thing is just uh, falling apart. And it's a function, and those of you who run DOT fleets, and a lot of you in the room are DOT fleet people, I mean, this is running calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, salt brine, ice slicer. The bottom line is that uh, we in, the, in this industry know that, uh, you know, the, over the 20 years that I've been doing this work, 20 years ago there was a lot of abrasives still being used, sand and things like that. Those really didn't hurt the trucks. But over the last 20 years, DOTs had moved to a black roads operation. They, they wanted, people want to drive on clear roads, and the move to clear roads has meant chemicals. And the move to chemicals has really 
not been factored in a lot of the fleet uh, planning. It was, there was, uh, really wasn't completely known when they started switching these chemicals, what it was gonna do to these trucks, but as you can see, it's really creating havoc. And I know some of the folks in the room here are on some of the corrosion committees and so on and so forth. And, and the reality is that somewhere or another that the DOTs have got to inform the public that if we're gonna keep a black road roadway as a standard for winter operations, that is essentially means that the trucks and the vehicles and the equipment you use to maintain those black roads are disposables, consumables, because they're just getting eaten alive. Simple as that. The work plan on this project, we did a literature review, we developed a life cycle model, we identified the year-over-year -year plans, and when we restrict, uh, recommended the strategy for dealing with those cracked frames that I just showed over the last couple of slides. And I'm not going to keep you in suspense. We recommended nine years as the target age for replacing the, uh, their uh, snowplow fleet, which is a very aggressive age. But part of that, I'll, I'll acknowledge right up front, we're writing to the state legislature. We needed to deliver a simple message, a clear message, a message that didn't take a whole lot of interpretation. This nine years age was reflective of the fact that we had 150 trucks that at any given point in time are highly problematic. So this is right on the leading edge of what we could support because we felt like we've got to get these trucks out of the fleet. So that was part and parcel of this recommendation. We also recommended, and this is actually came out of one of the um, best practices in winter maintenance uh, publication a year or so ago, uh, we recommended implementing a points-based equipment evaluation system on these snowplow trucks. Essentially what we're recommended to you, Dot, was a three-pronged approach to replacing their equipment. Age is one factor, mileage is one factor, and condition is one factor. And frankly, in the UDOT fleet, age and condition is much more important than mileage because, as I said, there you have such a constrained operating use for this equipment that at 10 years, they typically have about 130,000 miles on these vehicles. These are $225,000 per unit in the field vehicles, and they're only running them about six months a year, and they're only putting about 8,000 miles a year. But again, this is what I said, the public policy part of this. I'm not taking a business one way or the other. I'm just simply saying the impact of implementing that public policy has impacts, and this is part of those impacts. We recommended a five-year funding plan that would allow them to achieve that target uh, average fleet age of 4.5 years. That's half of the nine-year standard. That's what you would expect your average fleet to be, age to be. And we suggested they prior prioritize the replacement of those trucks with cracking frame issues. That didn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. But uh, uh, the, the net of it was it was part of a report that I'll, uh, that was provided to the state legislature as part of their, their annual budget uh, request process. Details on these recommendations. The life cycle model, I, I've, I've heard a lot smarter people than me over the last couple of days uh, uh, demonstrate various research on the life cycle approaches and various approaches to fleet uh, request or replacement. This is simply an implementation of those models. Uh, we, we looked at their PM and repair costs, we looked at their capital, capital cost, and then we came up with a total asset cost curve. And as I, I'll, there's a couple of nuanced comments I'll make to that, but I'm gonna hold that to the end, so. This is the utilization. This is very consistent with everything those of you who have been in uh, those presentations over the last couple of days about fleet use. As you can see that uh, the fleet use for the UDOT Class 8 fleet is very uh, almost uh, directly correlated with every year they use it 500 miles, 525 miles less than they did the year before. And that as those years go on, it's the, that stuff gets used less and less and less. And in fact, at some part point, the data starts falling apart because your information gets so uh, irregularly captured that you end up using projections instead of actuals. And we'll see that particularly in the cost area where we simply didn't have enough data after the equipment got beyond eight or nine years to really use the existing data. We had to extrapolate from it. 
Unit repair cost PM and repair. As you can see, highly correlated, 0.98 uh, R squared value. Uh, we're essentially showing that every year you use this equipment, it costs more than it did per year. As you can see, the cost per year in the first year, we were down there in the under $2,000 range. And every year that that equipment aged, we spent an extra 400 bucks on it. And it was very strongly correlated. Now you will notice that my trend line extends out about five years beyond my actual data line. This goes back to the point I was just making, that as that equipment got above 10 years old, which was the typical place they historically replaced this equipment, they simply didn't have enough data or enough good data to really show those maintenance cost trends. So you end up at some point, and this is a typical scenario, at some point when you start dealing with the oldest equipment, you find that you are not spending money on it. People are trying to be good stewards of the public resources and not wanting to throw money at this old equipment, but as a result, you don't have equipment expenditure records. The equipment's still out on your yard. It's rust into pieces, but you don't show that you're spending money on it, and if you're not real careful, you stand up in front of your bosses trying to explain why a 15-year-old truck costs you a lot less to operate than a 10-year-old truck. And the answer is because you simply aren't fixing that 10-year-old truck, or that 15-year-old truck. It's just sitting in the field. So this is part of the uh, art of the fleet management piece is to try to understand and to extrapolate that and to tell a, a story that you can get behind and understand, but it's also, you gotta be able to explain what's going on and why you're, uh, you know, why this is, uh, what they need to address in their recommendations and their capital planning. Now, there was a comment yesterday in the fleet committee and this was in fact the toughest piece of this project. How do you figure out what your capital costs are? How much residual value are you losing each year on this equipment? The reality is Nobody is selling equipment at years two, three, four, five, and six. And this equipment is highly specialized with hydraulics. They're using wing plows, front plows. They've got towed plows. These trucks weigh on average two to 3,000 pounds than their commercial class eight dumps that are doing it working in the construction industry. So the residual value the, or the aftermarket uh, is almost non-existent for these trucks. Not to mention the fact that after they've gone through eight or 10 years of calcium chloride and magnesium chloride, they're rusting off the frame rails. So you put it together and the bottom line is that the uh, actual sales records we had showed that on average, UDOT was getting $8,500 at year 10 for a truck that cost $225,000 to field. So in essence, in, in my view, that's essentially a sunk cost that the equipment, when you buy it, you've, just, you've spent that money, you can't recover that money, there's next to no ability to recover it in mid-cycle. So essentially you treat it as effectively as a sunk cost, that purchase cost, because at $8,000, it's a rounding error. So in, in, well, what we did, we had to model that somehow. So the, math, the financial model, straight line depreciation, show of the years depreciation, declining balance, the long and the short of it is they're all mathematical models associated with depreciation. It has really no use in fleet other than their models that provide some proxy for what the actual decline in residual value for this equipment represents. And obviously the one that had the, made the most sense to us was the declining balance one simply because that bottom curve more closely resembles what it, even in the light fleet world you would expect. So we have basically built in our, mat, our life cycle model. We use the declining balance model, which shows you depreciating the equipment the, the, as quickly as possible. And again, that is just simply an intuitive judgment basis because again, it, it, if the equipment is worth $8,000 at a year 10 or year 11, it didn't get, it wasn't worth uh, $6,000 at year five. I mean, it just didn't make any sense to us. So we knew it simply had to be depreciating faster. So using those values, this was the model that we essentially based our recommendations on. And this is not a traditional life cycle cost model. A traditional life cycle cost model, we would be summing that residual value loss over the years. We simply found that in this heavy duty class eight world, especially in this corrosion field environment, that that model just doesn't work 
for this kind of equipment and this kind of application. So what we essentially are looking at here is your top line, which is the combination of your uh, capital cost and your PM repair cost. They're expressed in a per mile basis. This goes to John's comment yesterday about trying to take in that, that loss of utilization that, that happens as this equipment ages. So in a nutshell, what we're saying is that at year nine, every year beyond year nine that we hold that equipment, it's costing us more money on a per mile basis than it did the year before. And again, I'll be the first to acknowledge those of you in the field who are professionals in this will acknowledge this is not a traditional life cycle model. I know that. But in this case, when the equipment is essentially uh, worth $8,000 at year 10 and it's rusting off the rails, the, if I ran it, I did run a traditional model on it and it said this I ought to run this truck 16 to 18 years. That's simply not supportable in fact. So that's, this is what we put together and this was essentially the basis of our recommendations. And again, our target audience here, UDOT knows exactly everything that I've shared with you but we're targeting this audience to the state legislature and we're trying to explain this, this scenario to them in the simplest fashion that will convey accurate information and we feel comfortable with what we've presented here. In our funding comparison, we looked at different ways we could try to reach that nine-year target at $225,000 a pop and 500 units. You're going to have to spend some pretty serious money to get that fleet age down. So we tried to figure out a way we could do it. And the bottom line was we looked at trying to do it over three years, four years, or five years. One of the things that I said previously about fleet is you really want to try to handle things systematically. And when you try to replace too much of your fleet too quickly, you get the snake that sw swallows a basketball effect. All of a sudden, you've got a whole bunch of new trucks and your shop standing around twiddling their thumbs for a year or two, and then in year eight, it's just Katie bar the door because all your trucks are aging out at the same time. So we attempt to smooth out that replacement plan and ultimately we decided that the five year plan was the optimal plan to do that and that's what you're looking at here. That by, in a, the five year plan by replacing, uh, if we follow that model that in, in five years we'll get our average fleet age down to about uh, uh, the target of nine years average age but you can see that up there, to, that we're spending a, a, a lot of money. You know, we're spending that first year, it was 11, 12, 14, 20, or 14, 13, et cetera. That's, again, that's roughly double, not, not exactly because I'm looking at mobile years, but bottom line, we're saying they're going to have to double their fleet expenditures to try to do this. And keep in mind, we're only talking one class of equipment. Their class eight trucks, that's ignoring the rest of their fleet. And I mean, that's, that's part of the message I think that the fleet managers in this room will echo is that, you know, you're trying to do this and do everything else and what a challenge it is in this physical environment. The frame repair options, as I said, the key thing to start with was the, if the truck's only worth $8,000, if I don't have a cracked frame, and I do have a cracked frame, what do I do with it? Well, you can, you can get a new frame from the manufacturer and you can have it, you can swap everything else all over, but the base cost without thinking about trying to replace all the other components, you dot costed this out at $47,000 a unit to replace that frame and swap over the components. Now, obviously, if you're going to invest that kind of money, you're going to rebuild everything on that truck while you're doing it. So you're looking at even a much higher bill in reality if you're really looking to try to renew or remanufacture that equipment. And the bottom line was they looked at a minimum of seven additional years to try to recover that investment. And in this environment, operating environment, it just, there was no set of circumstances that that was supportable. Instead, as a matter of just desperation, uh, in order to keep, meet their core mission of keeping the, the roads clear, they're doing this frame reinforcement option, which is, uh, uh, I would refer to, I had a colleague refer to this as flit fish plating, simply putting reinforcing steel on both sides of the frame where this is occurring. That treatment costs between ten dollars and $12,000. UDOT's experience with doing this is that they really can't extend the life of the equipment more than a couple of years because the underlying damage is still there. 
the oxidation is still occurring if the, the you know the rust is still going on in fact when you can find rust in a small area where you can't get to it easily you make it worse so that the bottom line was that the OEMs don't recommend it there were safety concerns along with it but the bottom line was they're still faced with this conundrum of they've got a core mission to keep the roads clean so they're doing this throwing good money after bad because they really don't have much of a choice so that's essentially where they are and as far as you know as far as the financial decision behind this it, it keeps coming back to the fact that it changed the residual value I, one iota i mean the bottom line is the truck was not worth one dime more after they did all of this than they did before so from a fleet manager financial perspective it's just bad decisions and worse decisions Other comments, uh, there's uh, UDOT, like a, a lot of DOTs, like a lot of city county fleets. There's uh, uh, emissions requirements. Salt Lake City's a borderline non attainment area. They're having to try to bring equipment in, and where they field equipment, they have to try to field the new equipment in the non attainment areas and try to do all of those machinations associated with trying to meet those competing goals that, that makes this a more complex and difficult problem. Corrosion, cor or <coughs> corrosion damage, it's a significant and ongoing concern. I know Greg back there in the back is on the corrosion committee and I mean this is something they're looking at sacrificial anodes, they've looked at all kinds of uh, treatments. I mean UDOT's looked at implementing a whole, you know, a wash rack, uh, an enclosed wash system, uh, on average $250,000 a pop to put one of those things in. You got all environmental issues associated with what do you do with the runoff, what do you do with the chemicals that you're spraying off the truck, how are you going to deal with that. The long and short of it is lots of tough options. Frankly, the best one in the near term is they've decided to essentially do the best they can cleaning their equipment with the resources they have try to push to replace the resources in the 600 pound grill that I haven't touched on was Utah like a lot of DOTs is seeing a steady push from the legislature to outsource work. They suspect that over the course of some period of time they'll be pushed or otherwise decide on their own to use more outsourced uh, snow clearing. And at that point, there's a real question about, well, what does that mean for our fleet needs? Those are questions that remain open at this point. And that's the reason I said there's a strong public policy issue to this project that, you know, that we should be aware of. It's not, fleet doesn't exist in its own little bubble, it exists in, within the public environment and a lot of public policy decisions affect the organization they're trying to support and the way the fleet operates. Other comments that UDOT has uh, been using the information from its peer states, from the uh, NCHRP studies, et cetera. They've been altering their specifications over time to try to address some of these issues. This core frame cracking issue I talked about was really related to a uh, what they used to refer to as a double rail, a nested C, whatever you want to call it. The bottom line is a two, two uh, member frame rail construction and essentially the DOTs over the last six or seven years have pretty much all gone away to a single rail construction so it gives it less space for that uh, fluids to gather. So that's addressed some of these issues, but in all honesty, they're still facing the issue that, heck, in seven, eight years, the dump beds are rusted off. The, the salt spreaders are rusted <laughs> out. Uh, they, I mean, they're literally replacing the engine oil pans about every uh, three or four years for the, the rust is de eating it off. So, I mean, at the long, and again, this goes back to the early point I said in this presentation. This has a to part and parcel of the decision for the public that they want, black, they want to drive on black roads. They want to, don't want to drive on snow. They want to, don't want to use abrasives. They want to drive on a clear highway. And this is part and parcel of those decisions. UDOT did do a uh, snowplow route study recently. They're in a pro they're essentially right now piloting the results of that survey. survey. Obviously, that has to do with the demand for trucks. They're, you know, the fun fundamentally, the 500 trucks UDOT has for snowplow uses is a function of how many lane miles one person can clear, and what's their plow route strategy. 
as part of this snowplow route study, they looked at trying to explore whether they could uh, modify those strategies, use different kinds of equipment, and fundamentally decrease the amount of equipment that was needed to provide that snow clearance. The results of that study were promising, that they think that they can get by with significantly fewer pieces of equipment, but they're not prepared to, to roll the dice on it. They're piloting it this winter. They're piloting some of those routes to see if that research pans out in the field, and if it does, then their whole equipment program will be revised to adjust to a lower base number, assuming that that's what the results support. And that uh, another comment is we, we were very clear with you, Doc, that these criteria that we're basing today is better available uh, data comes along and as particularly as they can cycle out some of these additional trucks that we, we, we acknowledge that this, equip, this analysis needs to be revisited. Uh, one, of the, one of the other factors that was unique, as, as John said in my intro, I've been in a lot of DOTs, UDOT does more owner perform maintenance than any DOT I've ever been in. And that's a really reflected in the fleet data, and I'm not going to say any more about that. It's, it's those of you who are in those environments understand what I'm saying. So it's, you can only do what you can with the data you have. So, you know, to some level or another, that, that was the reason we're hoping that as part of the ongoing work that maybe we can improve some of that data and maybe make some better decisions. Current status of this project, UDOT is uh, on, uh, consistent with the recommendations of the um, best practices in, uh, what was that study called, winter maintenance or snow fighting. In any event, they're attempting to <coughs> segregate their repair orders to capture some of this corrosion damage. That was one of the problems we ran into was that in our fleet database, we didn't have corrosion separated out from other mechanical or wear failures. And it was really hard to get a handle on how much this corrosion was, was driving their fleet costs. So we were, they're going to start segregating out by actually identifying corrosion-related items as part of their work order system so they can have a better understanding of what those costs are as opposed to the normal wear and tear operator uh, you know, cause damage, et cetera. The second step is a project I'm involved in right now, is they are currently, uh, we're in the process of designing a vehicle condition assessment system. We're, on, we're focusing it on the Class 8 fleet right now. It will actually be part of their annual vehicle and maintenance uh, service, what they call a B inspection. We're putting together a manual and an entire program where they literally have pictures of what an A piece of equipment, what an A door looks like, what an A firewall, a B, a C, a D, and an F. And essentially after everything's said and done, they're going to evaluate that piece of equipment for both wear and corrosion, and we're going to assign a point score to that. That point score will be part of that three-pronged approach that we talked about of age and mileage and condition in order to essentially do two or three things. It'll help us triage and figure out what priority to try to uh, replace this equipment and the question of where do I spend my next dollar? Do I, do I replace this truck or that truck? You need some kind of objective basis to try to do that, especially when you're in a situation where you never replace everything you want to and you really need to have some kind of hierarchical approach to do that. So, That'll be part of that. Part of that information will also be used to help support their annual budget request. We're going to show that this legislature that we have this much. Let's face it. The, the reality is this corrosion damage. You don't fix it until you have to. But you need to understand what amount of pin up maintenance demand you've got out there. So in this case, for instance, we hope to be able to show over time that last year, because you didn't fund our requested amount, that last year we had $11 million worth of defer deferred maintenance on these Class 8 trucks. This year it climbed to 13, and here's how we came up with that number. From our condition inspe uh, inspection system, we were able to extrapolate those costs. We can show that by not spending capital monies, we're increasing maintenance expenditures and we're getting deeper and deeper in the hole. It's part and parcel of telling your message, which is frankly, the, to me, that's one of the most important jobs a fleet manager has is he's got to be able to tell his message if he's going to get, uh, get the job done. 
The, uh, the other part of this thing is the sad part of this story is that <laughs> this, uh, this report, which we, were, uh, we felt like was a good product and that, that uh, UDOT took it to the legislature, well, it's just got stalled in the legislature with a whole lot of other things going on and where the public policy issue comes in. And the, maybe the most in, the point that I didn't raise was UDOT is not asking the legislature to put one dime of money in this. All UDOT is asking is for the ability to spend their money. This is not where they're asking the legislature to set aside additional funds. That UDOT is simply saying, can I spend more money on equipment? So that's all we're really talking about here. And the reality is UDOT has some additional fuel tax raise. The legislature promptly set a big chunk of that money aside for outside contracting, said UDOT can't spend it internally. So that's that's why I said this is a this is a study about public policy. So anyway, that's it. Uh, any questions or comments? Yeah, Henry, you said that the crews were performing a lot of the preventative maintenance work. <clears throat> were you capturing that data in the it is, Bruce, but I'll be honest, uh, I don't think it would shock you that I'm highly suspect of that data. I see, uh, frankly, I see PMs costing the same for every piece of equipment. So, you know, it's just being pencil whipped. Any other questions? Thank you for your time.